With more than 6,000 small and micro-cap companies listed, if you're looking for the next Apple, at the earliest stage, then Channel Check truly is the orchard. The listed companies support Channel Check, so it's free for you, the potential investor, to gain access to institutional quality research from FINRA licensed analysts, advanced market data, industry reports, news, and a growing catalog of videos and webcasts. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and register for Channel Check so you're always up to date on what's going on at the small and microcap data place. Welcome to the Transportation Logistics Forum, a NobleCon online investor event presented by Channel Check and Noble Capital Markets. Noble is an SEC registered, FINRA licensed broker dealer and the source of the equity research available on Channel Check. This presentation features Genco Shipping and Trading, NYSE ticker symbol GNK, following a brief overview presentation from CFO Apostolos Sofolius, SVP of Strategy and Finance Peter Allen, and President and CEO John Wobensmith, Noble Research Analyst Poe Fratt will moderate a Q&A session. With that, I am pleased to present Apostolos, Peter, and John. Okay, well, thank you very much. My name is John Wobensmith. I am the CEO of Genco Shipping and Trading. Uh, with me today is Apostolos Sofolius, our Chief Financial Officer, and Peter Allen, our Senior Vice President of Strategy and Finance, as well as our internal dry bulk market analyst. Um, Thank you very much to, to Noble and, uh, and Poe Frat for having us here today. And what I'd like to do is uh, start with, uh, with a brief presentation and then we'll go into uh, to Q&A with, with Poe. So Genco Shipping and Trading is the largest US-based dry bulk ship owner. We have 44 ships that focus on the, tra the global transportation of commodities. We're, we're really providing a full service logistics solution for our customers getting their cargo uh, from point A to point B in the most efficient manner possible and handling all aspects of that um, from, from loading it all the way through discharge on our owned vessels. We are transporting iron ore, bauxite, grain, cement, nickel ore all around the world globally um, with quite a bit of a focus in, uh, in the Atlantic Basin but also the Pacific. We are headquartered in New York City but we also have chartering offices in Singapore where we run our Cape size vessels, our largest vessels that are predominantly shipping iron ore. And then we also have a chartering commercial office in Copenhagen where we are shipping our minor bulk commodities that are sourced uh, out of Europe. We have a very large and scalable fleet, again, concentrating on both the major and minor bulks. And we do like to have direct exposure to every commodity uh, that is available to be carried in, uh, in the dry bulk shipping industry. In terms of corporate governance, we are ranked number one uh, by Weber Research in their 2021 ESG scorecard. We're very proud of that. We are, again, a U.S. listed, um, U.S. filer, highly transparent um, in terms of reporting uh, for the dry bulk shipping industry. And we're traded under ticker symbol GNK. We go to the next slide, we can take a look at the global trade, uh, dry bulk trade and the key routes. You can also see that 90% of global trade is carried by the international shipping industry. Of that, 45% is exclusively dry bulk. So it's almost half of all the trade uh, that is carried globally. On the bottom part of the slide, you'll see the very key trade routes. Uh, the longest haul trade routes are, are what you can see in the red and the green going from Brazil, going into China, um, shipping iron ore and grain. Again, a lot, of, um, a lot of exposure that we have directly to those routes as we're shipping both of those commodities. If we look specifically at Genco, we've given you a breakdown um, in terms of percentage of cargoes that we carried in 2020. Again, iron ore being the predominant one, that, that is uh, carried on our Cape size vessels. And then we have grain, cement, fertilizers, pig iron, bauxite, some of the more minor bulk cargoes that we carry on our mid-sized vessels. We're a firm believer in having a mixed fleet, what we call our barbell strategy, where we have exposure 
to on the on the larger vessels, the Cape size on the iron ore front, but also direct exposure to all the minor bulk commodities with our mid-size fleet. In terms of our third quarter 2021, we are approaching full execution of our value strategy. Apostolos is going to go into, uh, into that in more detail in a few minutes. But as part of that, we, we have agreed to acquire, and we have acquired six Ultramaxes since April of 2021. Uh, four of these have been delivered in Q3. We have two additional ships that'll be delivering in the very early part of January. We have made a conscious effort to delever um, in a very significant way. We have paid down $144 million of debt through September of 2021, and we are targeting to get down to $246 million of debt, which represents today only a 15% a net loan to value at the end of the year. Delevering is a very important part of our value strategy so that we drive our cash flow break even uh, to as low as possible um, so that we can have um, the highest dividend payout without having to put money towards, uh, towards debt service. We did close on a $450 million brand new credit facility this year, which gave us a very large revolving credit facility as well uh, for use and growth going forward as, as we see fit. Um, we have secured cash flows. We have taken advantage of the firm market last year, fixing uh, one to two year rates anywhere from $23,375 a day up to $32,000 per day on our capes. And most, and most of those were done under two year arrangements. We have increased our quarterly dividend to 15 cents a share for the third quarter. And we've declared a total of $1.05 uh, per share over the last nine quarters. But the first dividend that will be payable under this new value strategy will be for the fourth quarter cash flows that will be paid during uh, during the first quarter um, and announced at our at our earnings release. With that, I'm going to turn uh, the next piece of the presentation over to our CFO, Apostolos Sofolius. Thank you, John. Um, on slide 10, we've laid out the, um, uh, our value strategy, which is basically based on three main pillars, namely dividends, the leveraging, and growth. In 2021, we have, as John mentioned, concentrated on paying down debt in order to further strengthen our balance sheet and reduce our break-even levels and set the company up to pay dividends throughout the cycles. By the end of the year, we're targeting $246 million of debt and are planning to continue to pay down debt going forward on a voluntary basis with a, with a target of net debt of zero in the medium term. We believe that our fleet's significant operating leverage combined with the resilience of a strong balance sheet and the ability to, um, the, the, the ability to pay attractive dividends through the cycles provides a compelling risk, risk reward balance that can't really be replicated by our peers in, in today's market. It also provides a solid platform for growth uh, with optionality regardless of market conditions. In a weak market, we can utilize our strong balance sheet uh, reserves and the revolver to take advantage of counter seasonal opportunities. In a strong market, we can utilize the significant operating leverage of the fleet to improve valuation and use our shares as currency for growth. On the next slide, we just lay out the dividend framework uh, and calculations. Um, we're targeting to pay the first dividend under the new policy in the first quarter of next year based on the results of the fourth quarter of this year. And the policy is going to be based on cash flow after debt service, lesser reserve, and capital expenditures. We have set the reserve at $10.75 million for the fourth quarter based on an anticipated debt repayment of $8.75 million in Q1 and $2 million of interest expense. Um, there, it's important to say that the reserve can be used for additional growth uh, to potentially smooth out uh, some of the volatility and to otherwise provide additional flexibility under our capital allocations efforts. And also important that we will, on an ongoing basis, provide guidance uh, on both the expense side as well as the reserve side ahead of the quarter uh, to the investors so that they have visibility on a go-forward basis. The rationale behind the new dividend policy, as well as the, the reserve uh, establishment, is really based on long-term historical data that we've looked over the past 20 years. 
as you'll see on slide 12, in pretty much every rate environment within that period, PCE rates when weighted for our fleet have been higher than a break-even rate prior to debt service, which is illustrating the importance of continuing to pay down debt, reducing the break-even levels, and building all, and also building a reserve based on uh, debt service going forward. Um, <clears throat> that combined with the significant fleet-wide operating leverage, uh, which is illustrated on slide 13, um, gives us the opportunity to create a more compelling risk-reward balance for our shareholders. And in the, in the meantime, we also concentrate on opportunistically fixing some charters to provide some stability in cash flow generation, but also to de-risk certain acquisitions that we did uh, specifically in the Ultramax sector uh, over this year. Uh, you'll see on page 14, we have agreed to uh, fix four cave size vessels and four Ultramax vessels on durations from anywhere from 10 months to 25 months. Uh, and, at rate, and at rates from $20,000 to, to, to a little over $30,000 per day, per vessel. On slide 15, uh, you can see our, our, our EBITDA development over the past five years, um, showing really the operating leverage that we discussed earlier uh, in numbers. For the third quarter, our adjusted EBITDA was $80 million, which to put in perspective is higher than the adjusted EBITDA for all of 2020. And our nine month EBITDA number of $150 million is higher than any of the last four years full uh, year figure. Lastly, on 16, uh, we'll just show you the development of our TCE. Uh, for Q3, our TCE was over $29,000 a day. And we, uh, we anticipate a further improvement in Q4 as our estimates represent a TCE of about $37,000 a day uh, across the fleet for 71% of our owned available days. I will now pass it back to John uh, for the next slide. Yeah, so before we uh, we get into the specific market discussion, which, which Peter Allen will go through, um, I want to just highlight um, what one of the most important aspects of the, of the market and the industry as a whole, and that is the supply and demand equation. So the supply being the number of ships that are on the water and to be delivered, versus the demand growth of commodities on a on a year by year basis. We have seen a tremendous amount of volatility in the dry bulk shipping shipping industry over the years. You can see the fleet growth uh, candles, if you will, in, in the graph in blue versus trade growth in green. And what we have seen is as the industry um, has recovered from time to time, it has built more and more ships from an oversupply standpoint. Um, and it and unfortunately has pushed down freight rates. What we are now going through is a historically low order book at 7%. And you can see all the way over on the right side of the graph that we finally have uh, supply being outstripped by demand growth this year on the back of a very low order book going forward. And so we are, it takes very little incremental demand growth to continue to outstrip supply going into next year, 2023, and at this point, 2024 as well. And Peter Allen will give you more detail on that and why that is the case. But I think it's very important to keep in mind that it is the supply side of the equation that can take, um, that can hurt the dry bulk market over, over the medium term whereas demand growth shocks are very short-lived. And we have now come into a period for a variety of reasons, which Peter will go over, where we're in a low supply environment and expect um, demand to continue to outstrip that over the next few years. So with that, I'll turn it over to Peter Allen. Thanks, John. So I will uh, start over here just uh, discussing freight rates 2021 has obviously been a, uh, a very strong year for dry bulk shipping. Uh, it's It's been the best year in over a decade. We've seen cape size rates highlighted by the blue line on the graph there touch $86,000 per day. They've come off since, uh, but still at strong levels at approximately $30,000 a day. Whereas the, uh, the Baltic Supermax Index, which is more linked to global GDP growth and minor bulk commodities, that has seen essentially a steady churn upwards throughout the course of the year uh, and currently sits around $28,000 a day. 
historically, there is a very strong correlation between freight rates uh, as well as asset values. And, and we've seen that play out uh, once again in 2021, where uh, freight rates have increased to decade plus highs and asset values have followed uh, nearly doubling uh, in some cases. They've come off slightly uh, just with the pullback in rates, but are still uh, still at very strong levels relative to the beginning of the year. When we look at the main drivers of dry bulk trade, iron ore imports are approximately 30% of total dry bulk trade. So that's that's a big focus uh, within this industry and iron ore imports obviously go directly into steel production. Uh, China produces well over 50% of global steel uh, and their, their steel production has come under pressure uh, in the second half of the year. Some of it self-imposed due to the government looking to cap uh, steel production on a year-over-year -year basis, essentially flat. Uh, but it also needs to be put in perspective that it's coming off of record highs, uh, as you can see on the graph on the left. But uh, the key difference and what we've seen materialize over the course of the second half of 2021 is the disconnect between iron ore imports as well as steel production. So steel production typically peaks in the second quarter. Uh, spring constru construction season is the peak time for China, whereas iron ore availability and seaborne supply, which as dry bulk ship owners were more concerned about, that typically peaks, that supply typically peaks in the second half of the year. So we're seeing a situation in November, for example, where China imported 100 million tons of iron ore, but their steel production declined. So, so that disconnect has certainly played out, uh, but we've still seen very strong freight rates uh, despite that. Going to coal, which is the second largest uh, dry bulk commodity uh, in, in terms of percentages, uh, that trade has actually been very strong in the, in the short term. Uh, typically in China, we see that trade tail off into year end. However, this year it's essentially been the opposite where uh, we've seen China really import a significant amount of coal just due to energy shortages and low stockpiles. Uh, we're also seeing a redirection of trade flows as China is not importing much coal from Australia and the Australian coal is going to India, Japan, South Korea, and uh, the longer ton miles of coal going into China have taken effect and essentially tightened the supply and demand dynamics of that coal trade. The, uh, the underpinning essentially of our positive thesis going forward for the dry bulk shipping industry is the low order book as a percentage of the fleet. While we've had decade plus high rates, the ordering has been pretty limited which historically has not been the case. Typically you see a strong market and then you see a, a supply side reaction to that where there's massive ordering. This time it's been different and the order book is essentially still at historically low levels at only 7% of the fleet, whereas 7% of the, of, the, of the fleet that's 20 years or older uh, is essentially gonna be scrapped over the next few years offsetting a lot of this oncoming supply. So it's a really positive supply and demand situation underpinned by the order book. And one of the positives we're seeing, there's been wide scale ordering on the container side, uh, which has actually taken up a lot of uh, new building slots. So if a dry bulk ship owner wanted to order a new conventional fuel ship today, that ship would likely be uh, coming on the water in 24 or 25. So there's a good window of runway uh, based on uh, the supply dynamics right now um, that, uh, that gives you a good visibility over the next few years. Now, putting this all together, we're very positive on the supply and demand fundamentals over the next few years. We highlight here how demand growth is expected to outstrip supply growth uh, primarily uh, this year, uh, as well as next year and, and beyond. Uh, the, the key thesis is obviously the order book, but also when we look at GDP, which dry bulk trade tends to be linked to, uh, especially the minor bulk. Uh, we're expecting uh, the IMF is, is forecasting approximately 5% growth next year after a strong year this year. And then when we start talking about China, which is the big engine for dry bulk trade, uh, they are, we see them shifting to a more accommodative policy uh, to defend their growth target of approximately 5%. Uh, and then on top of that, the rest of the world, we expect to continue to be strong uh, in terms of economic activity, which has been a big theme so far in, uh, in 2021. Uh, and, and with that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it back over to John. Thank you, Pete. So just finishing up on the, uh, on the last slide here and concluding, um, in terms of the management team, U.S.-based, very experienced management team, Genco is a U.S. filer with obviously very high corporate governance standards, ranked number one by Rep Weber's research ESG 2021 report. 
In terms of the dry bulk market, which uh, which Peter Allen just went through, we continue to see going forward demand outstripping the supply of new ships coming on. Um, again, on the backdrop of a historically low order book and supply growth for the next few years. The commercial platform, active management, we're in direct contact with our clients, booking direct flight, freight to provide a full service logistics solution. We have a track, me track record of outperforming our benchmarks and the indices. We have been expanding our fleet in the Ultramax sector. We bought nine ships since December of 2020. In terms of the fleet overall, we believe again in this in the barbell approach in terms of having direct exposure to commodities, iron ore, all the way down to grain and through the minor bulks with our Cape size and our ultra supermax vessels. And our capital structure, we've introduced our new value strategy, very strong balance sheet, meaningful cash position, meaningful cash dividends that will uh, that will begin to be paid in the first quarter based on fourth quarter cash flows. The biggest thing on the value strategy is that the company has a tremendous amount of operating leverage, which Apostolos went through earlier, but we have brought our financial leverage down significantly. And we think that that creates the best risk reward model within the peer group for dry bulk shipping so that we're able to pay a dividend during any type of market going forward. So with that, thank you very much. And we'll now uh, hopefully go back to Poe for, uh, for some Q&A. Thanks to the Genco team. Uh, John, Apostolos, and Peter, you did a great job as always. Um, I don't have that many questions, but if we could just cover a couple on the macro side and then we'll switch to you know, the Genco side. Um, when you look at the overall 2022 outlook, you know, what is your outlook for the different market segments? And then can you talk about whether we're going to see some, you know, typical seasonality or not? Sure. I mean, let, let's let's talk about the seasonality first, if that's OK, because I, I think we're beginning to see it right now, um, where typically towards the end of the year and, and going into the first quarter of, of any year, you have a slowdown in, in iron ore imports. Um, a lot of that has to do with typical slowdown in China on steel production and construction activity due to the time of year during the winter season. You also have, particularly in Brazil, maintenance periods, and you typically have you know, higher rainfall from a seasonal standpoint, so production levels are lower on the iron ore front. I don't see anything different this year. I think this year, going into the first quarter, we'll, we'll see that downward seasonality. Um, I still think it's they're gonna be healthy rates um producing positive cash flows for the for the industry and i believe you will see um you know that go that the demand start to recover post olympics um in china and as we get towards the end of the first quarter steel production move up again um and and iron ore uh start to move up having said that i think we're going to have a pretty strong grain season in in the in the first quarter um and we're certainly seeing um, that materialized for the mid-size sector. So I, I think overall, first quarter, yeah, sure, from a seasonal standpoint, we'll um, we'll see some lower freight rates. But again, we're we're going to see definitively positive cash flows. And when you look at some of the factors that have been positive this year, you know, congestion, whether it's congestion or some you know friction on the the crew chain side, and a firm you know container market, do you think those will be factors next year? Let me. I'll take the container market, and then, and then Peter, maybe maybe you can fill in on um, on on some of the other some of the other items. I I do think, um, and we've seen this. The container ship companies continue to order new vessels, even going into 2024 right now, and I think that's very helpful to filling up berths so that there is no ability for uh, for dry bulk ship owners to uh, to order new vessels. Um, so again, we're keeping a lid on a very low supply situation, which I think uh, you know gives the market legs for uh, for the next few years. The other uh, the other interesting thing is because of the firmness of the container ship market on our backhaul trades and our typically lower paying uh, freight rate trades, we've been able to ship do some container shipments 
um, and actually earn a premium uh, to what we would be normally earning in the backhaul. Now we're not turning the company into a container ship company, just to be very clear. But you know, we look at these op these situations as opportunistic, and we're we're always willing, um, obviously, to try to to increase cash flows. So we have been able to do a little bit of that. But Peter, do you want to uh, fill in a little bit on on some of the other? Sure. Thanks, John. So uh, on congestion, Paul, your, your other point there, um, look, it's, it's no doubt been above trend this year uh, in 2021, given COVID restrictions as well as quarantine periods. Uh, and obviously, you know, we, we all know in the mainstream media, the, uh, the, the supply chain uh, discussion that's been, that's been going on daily. But um, the interesting thing about that, so certainly above trend congestion, but any sort of like weather event that you see in, in, uh, in China, for example, that, that has a significant impact on, on freight rates. And we've seen that materialize in the fourth quarter to a certain extent. And what that really shows us is just how tight the supply and demand dynamic is. Uh, that one little mini weather event can actually lead to five, $10,000 moves in cape size rates. So what that really speaks to is that this market is a lot tighter than it was five, six, seven years ago. And uh, we're essentially in balance to potentially out of balance where uh, there's almost a shortage of ships due to uh, above trend congestion. So, so that's been pretty interesting to see happen over, uh, over the last few months. Yep, and John highlighted, you know, the firm container market is gonna, you know, keep the order book low. Is there anything that beyond the container market, you know, ordering that could change the supply outlook or the order book for dry bulk? Yeah, look, I still think the um, the the emissions rules and 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 the goals of getting to uh, net zero on on carbon emissions by 2050 um, keep the order book low at this point because the there has still not been a firm decision made on what fuels we will be using going forward. I, I do think we're we're starting to settle out as ammonia and, and hydrogen and, and possibly methanol as, as, as future fuels. But I still think there's a lot of uncertainty um, in terms of ordering. Certainly owners, I would think, would be hesitant to order ships with conventional fueled engines at this point, um, because I think the typical useful life for a dry bulk vessel with a conventional engine will start to come down um, again as we get into more and more IMO regulations and we get closer um, to some of the hurdle rates to get to that net zero carbon emissions by 2050. So I think that is also very helpful. Um, I can tell you in general, Genco, you know, in the in the short term, you know, we're going to be spending close to $9 million next year um, on our existing fleet to make them more fuel efficient. Um, and the great thing about that, or as I call win-win, is we're reducing our carbon footprint, but at the same time, we're getting a return on that because we're burning less fuel. Um, and so we'll we'll do that next year. We'll do that as we get into 2024 as well on some of our additional vessels. But again, we're we're focused on the future and, and we're focused on the next energy um, that will be used. And as I said, it will most likely be ammonia and in hydrogen to fuel ships to get to that zero emissions by uh, by 2050 and hopefully quite a bit sooner than that. John, you sort of addressed how you're, you're positioning yourself for the carbon emission rules that are going to come and st um, you know come up next year initially. What, what do you think it's going to do to the industry? I mean, one thing I've heard is that you know if you limit power and curb efficient uh, you know emissions that way you're going you're going to have to slow down the fleet. Is that something that you agree with? And can you order magnitude? What, it what do you think it does to effective supply? So I, I do agree with it. Peter, why don't you, uh, again, why don't maybe color in a little bit? But but yes, Poe, I, I think there's some very interesting things uh, for dry bulk in terms of slowing down due to uh, 2023 IMO regulations. Yeah, just to, just to pick it up, uh, certainly slowing down the fleet is probably the easiest thing to do, and, and you don't have any capital out the door either. Uh, so that would be one of the low-hanging fruits, uh, per se. Um, but when we look at effective supply and, and the overall fleet in general, only 30% of the drivable fleet is considered eco, so like five years or less, five, six years or less. Uh, and, and those are the ships that we've been buying, and, and that's been a big drive for us, is selling the, the older, less fuel-efficient ships and investing 
in uh, modern eco ultramax is high specification chips uh, but when we look at just like what a half a knot does uh, on the cape size fleet that's approximately three percent effective capacity uh, so when you start to look at 15 to 20 year old capes or just you know the 15 year old ships in general that's 17 percent of the fleet so um, those ships could become less competitive uh, but essentially it's are the charters going to going to say you know i'm not going to charter an older less fuel efficient ship and, and really drive that eco premium per se so so that's some of this is also going to be not only um, regulated by the imo but also how large charters are going to handle this and whether they essentially put their money where their mouth is because we, we know what the, the rhetoric has been in the public but uh you know hopefully we see some some action as well let's switch over to genco in particular you know as as you guys have highlighted, you know, 2021 has been a year of significant progress, whether it's looking at the fleet expansion, whether it's looking at financial leverage, the capital structure, you know, and the new capital allocation policy. You know, what, everything's, you know, it's been a year of significant progress. What, what do you think um, when you look at fleet composition going forward? It's expanded from the Ultramax side. Do you think that's where you'll be focusing more going out five years or sort of, can you give us an idea of what your fleet's going to look like in five years? I don't, I don't see too much of a change in strategy overall, Poe. Again, we like to have that direct exposure. So we, we believe in the barbell approach. Um, as Pete mentioned, we, we will continue to cycle out of, uh, of some of our older, less fuel efficient vessels and redeploy that capital into more fuel efficient vessels. But I still see us in the Cape size, the larger ship sector, um, as well as the midsize sector um, going forward. And, and we've built very strong commercial teams around both of those asset classes. And then, you know, your scrubber decision that you made, you installed them on the Capes. Um, you know, is there, it looks like fuel spreads might widen um, as we look into 22 with higher energy demand, what's your assumption for fuel spreads in 2022? And then any thoughts on potentially installing scrubbers on the rest of your fleet? Um, so we, as you, as you mentioned, we, we installed scrubbers on our larger vessels, our Cape size vessels. Those are the ships that are at sea the longest and performing the longest trade routes and, and clearly consuming the most amount of fuel. So in, from a, return standpoint or risk standpoint, um, you know, we, we feel we made the right decision putting those on the larger vessels. Um, in terms of spreads, the spread today, I think is about $180. It did cross 200 not too long ago. Um, but if you look at the forward curve, that spread is due to come back down as we get into next year, $120, $130. The, the interesting thing for us though, is that we have, by the end of the year, we will have paid off the cost and the installation cost of our scrubbers. Um, and so that's over a two year time period. So anything we have going forward is pure return um, on that investment. And I, and I think that's really important. I still don't see the, uh, the, the, the investment logic anyway on installing scrubbers on the, on the smaller vessels. So I don't see us doing, doing any of that um, going forward. The payback period is just, uh, is just too long. Um, but it's worked out very well in the larger ships. And then in the, you know, you, as you mentioned, rates are a little bit higher than longer term averages. And generally, you know, the view is that rates will stay relatively elevated. Can you talk about your chartering strategy in, in a higher rate environment? Does it change at all? Do you shift um, your focus at all? Uh, towards longer term charters. Can you just give us a flavor on how you view, you know, your chartering strategy looking out over the next year to two years? Well, so first of all, we believe very strongly in the market. So you, I don't think you, you're, you're not going to see us put the whole fleet away under charter. However, um, particularly on the larger, more volatile Cape size uh, ships, it, from time to time, you will see us take exposure off the table and lock things in. Um, we did that last year, uh, or I should say this year. I'm, I'm already into 2022, at least mind, mindset-wise. We did that uh, in, in 
in September of two thousand of this year, um, we did two. We were able to do two two-year deals. Um, at one was at twenty nine thousand. One was at thirty two thousand dollars a day. Those are those are very good rates for long term. We also did a couple one-year charters also in the Cape size sector. Um, so I look, I think that'll continue. You'll, you'll see us de-risk from time to time as the market uh, moves back up as we get into next year and, and we can do some pretty good one or, or two-year deals. But again, we, we believe very much in the market. Um, so I, I, um, we, we will still have quite a bit of our ships trading in the spot. But from a, from a risk management standpoint, when you're at thirty thousand dollars a day for two years on capes, to me it makes sense to uh, take that exposure off the table. Okay, and then when we look at your, you know, at your customer base, any signs that higher rates are impacting, you know, either the the cargo market or you know customer shipments? Um, no, I, I mean, I, I, I think in the look, it, this is a volatile market, Poe, and and you know, here we are again into you know first quarter seasonality, which which is which is normal. Um, I, I don't think it is necessarily impacting uh, customers in in any sense. We um, we uh, we've been growing our customer base, if if that's if that's a good benchmark um, in 2021. So I think that's very positive. Um, the iron ore market. Is, you know, is run by the majors, um, so we haven't seen too much growth in terms of a customer base there. We we deal with all of the major companies, but in the minor bulks, yeah, we we've been consistently adding um, this year, and and we've established also some long-term relationships and COAs, contracts of freightment, um, which have been helpful to uh, to put in the book. And congratulations on the you know establishing the value strategy. Um, look forward to the first dividend in the first quarter of 22. Can you talk about how you potentially will manage the fluctuations in the dividend? And then also, do stock buybacks fit into the, the capital allocation strategy at all? So it, look, the, the value strategy is, um, is a formula. Um, it is based on operating cash flow, uh, which Apostolos went through clearly operating cash flow will fluctuate from quarter to quarter. Um, but again, the idea is to have that low leverage so that we never have to turn the dividend off, that we can always pay a dividend no matter, no matter what, is, uh, what is happening in the market. But we are also establishing a reserve. Um, and that reserve can be used for fleet renewal. It could be used uh, for smoothing out maybe a, a, a downward quarter um, you know, if, if we feel the next quarter is going to be positive, we could dip into that to keep things a little more consistent. And we can also use that reserve uh, for share buybacks also. So a lot of optionality for the management team and the board um, to utilize that reserve. In terms of share buybacks, um, right now anyway, our number one concentration is getting our debt and paying our debt down to $246 million at year end. Um, getting our first dividend um, under 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 our arm, and uh, and then as we get into next year and we have the reserve, again, you know, we'll we'll look at these things opportunistic and we'll look at it quarter by quarter and and decide what the best thing uh, to do is in terms of share buybacks or debt repayment or or fleet renewal. Yeah, you sort of covered it. Sounds like John, some of the strategic goals for 22, you know, delevering still. Find paying down debt and then shifting, you know, the capital strategy to the dividends. Any other strategic goals for 22? Oh, I look, I, I think we hit it. I mean, we're we're still yeah. focused on fleet renewal. We're still focused on growth. Um, you know, I'm a, a big believer in consolidation, even though we haven't seen it, uh, you know, quite quite uh, quite as I would have expected in dry bulk. But we're still going to continue to to push for that. Um, and in the meantime, I, I still think it's, uh, I think from an investment standpoint, it still makes sense to acquire ships if you're looking at values versus uh, versus freight rates and cash on cash return numbers. So I, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's fleet renewal, it's looking for growth, um, getting the value strategy implemented and hopefully seasoned so that the company can start to trade away from this concept and that asset value and more on a free cash flow and, and dividend yield basis. 
And John, what, what, what do you think would be potentially the biggest surprise looking at 2022, either positive or negative? <laughs> well, look, this industry is, uh, is very much centered around China. Um, and I think if you, I think if, with what's happening in China now with the loosening of uh, monetary policy, I believe the steel, steel production will come back again post Olympics. Um, I think the Chinese economy will do quite well next year, which will bode well for the demand side of, of dry bulk shipping. I think it's important to point out that the rest of the world is recovering as well. Steel production is up in Europe, it's up in India. Um, we're seeing more and more commodities on the minor bulk side grow and move around the world with infrastructure projects. Um, we have the US, which is typically you know, not a driver of, of dry bulk demand, but I have to mention it with the new infrastructure bill, we're definitely gonna be importing more cement. So I think that bodes well for our, for our mid-sized vessels. If you take all of that on the demand side, I, I will go back to what I've said several times um, you know, during, during, this, during this presentation, and that is we are in a very low supply environment, which is, you know, should bode well for the next few years for, for dry bulk shipping. Yeah, I think that, you know, we're setting up the, for the positive surprise that people are expecting a downturn next year, and it's not going to quite pan out that way. Well, I really appreciate John and Apostolos and Peter for joining us today. Um, enjoy the year end, and here's to a, a 2022 that certainly will be interesting. Thank you so much for your time. Great. Thank you, Paul. Have a good holiday. Thank you for joining us for this NobleCon online investor event presentation brought to you by Channel Check and Noble Capital Markets. Visit our YouTube channel for more video content, including interviews, virtual roadshows, and conference presentation replays. New content is added regularly, so subscribe below to stay up to date. Visit channelcheck.com or click the link in the description to access equity research, news, and advanced market data on this and the 6,000 other small and microcap companies listed.